Sometimes it's all about timing. Today's iconic guest tells us how he and his band created the most viral music video in MTV history in like two hours. They threw it together on one day. The very next day, it was on MTV, back when turnaround time was a lot longer. Also, this band is always tagged as a one-hit wonder, but they really weren't. They had four hits, including three that are wholly recognizable and played all the time from the 80s. Actually, from 1982 to 1984, this band was arguably the face of 80s music due to the lead singer's iconic look, but by the mid-80s, they completely disappeared. Today, we talk to their iconic singer and find out what exactly happened coming up next on Professor of Rock. Hey, music junkies, Professor of Rock, always here to celebrate the greatest artists and the greatest songs of all time. You know, if you ever got your hair cut or styled or grew it out long to, to look like your favorite rock star, <laughs> you're gonna dig this channel. And make sure to subscribe below so that you always get the latest episodes of the story straight from the legends and click the bell so you know when they're coming out. You know, timing is everything, especially in music. 1979 and 1982, that was a fascinating four-year window in popular music. It's kind of sad now because we uh, don't really see this kind of movement in music anymore. We have too much at our fingertips. There's almost no wonder left. But let's go back in time where the radio airwaves and the static of cable TV were still the wild, wild west, where uh, young artists and bands were exploring new technology, new instruments, and creating new genres and styles uh, by the minute. You know, punk was given way to new wave. Yeah, <laughs> Disco was transforming into synth pop and dance music. Hard rock and heavy metal uh, were dominating the arenas. After midnight, the and everything was influencing everyone. Every day was a, a new adventure, traveling across the, the sonic landscapes, if you will. Blondie was trying everything from rap to, to rock to new wave. Talking heads, they just threw out the book completely. The cars uh, were reestablishing Rock's past while giving us a look into the future. In the middle of all of this, MTV was born in the late summer of 1981. This is it. Welcome to MTV Music Television. The world and just like that, uh, you now had to be a matinee idol in addition to being able to sing a song or write a catchy song. Meanwhile, the troops were enlisting and preparing for battle in the UK. America be warned, the British were coming. Front line of the second British invasion that was led by the Human League. Along with Soft Cell. And Flock of Seagulls. with Duran Duran and Billy Idol and some more flanking to the right and left. On the 3rd of July, 1982, the Human League's Don't You Want Me started a three-week reign on the top of the Hot 100. Of course, the song got a massive boost from MTV Airplay, and then Soft Cell's remake, Tainted Love, spent a record-breaking 43 weeks on the Hot 100. And the September 1982 arrival of MTV in the media capitals of New York City and Los Angeles, that started a revolution that was televised this time, and it swung into what is known as the video era. By that fall of 1982, a group called the Flock of Seagulls, uh, they took their single, I Ran So Far Away, a new wave parentheses song, uh, whose music video and lead singer's haircut would be ingrained upon our pop psyche for eternity. Get away. 
from there, the floodgates exploded as, as Billy Idol and Duran Duran made their new singles, Dual Threats, a song and video, giving them the kind of exposure that artists could only dream of before. The world had changed. Romance by a flock of seagulls and then some. Unfortunately, after that, uh, I ran, or after I ran, ran all over the charts. A of seagulls became kind of overshadowed by their far out name and, and by lead singer and keyboardist Mike Score's unusual hairstyles. Uh, of course, proven by pop culture name drops and Pulp Fiction. You, Flock of Seagulls, you know why we're here? And the wedding singer, just to name a few. Hey, do you like Flock of Seagulls? I can see you do. But despite all that, the song I ran in its uh, corresponding music video remains a, a study in that monumental time. It was all so new. I remember seeing it on MTV as a young kid and being just mesmerized by its sci-fi themed ambiance and you know the do-it-yourself campy art set design. The song had a, a few distinct and catchy hooks as well. I mean, the opening instrumental is instantly recognizable in no small part because of the use of the delay in the electric guitar chords. Mike Score's vocal melody is just highly distinctive with each verse built around the two key phrases. And of course, the tempo of the song accentuates the emotion, the desire to escape allowing Iran so far away to give us as listeners an uh, evocative sonic experience supported perfectly by the music and the lyrics. Critics uh, are divided on A Flock of Seagulls' legacy. Some will say that uh, the band was at the right place at the right time, flowing into the U.S. along with the Soft Cell and the Human League. The public's infatuation with Score's hairstyle that led people to push him aside as an example of New Wave's style over substance. That's really a lazy critique. Mike Score is now completely bald, so the strength was not in the hair nor in the music video. I mean, we're still singing the songs. They're still a, a part of, of pop culture every day. Space Age Love Song? It's one of the finest songs of the 80s. Iran is a true study in the magnetic duo of synth and guitar with as much emphasis on the latter as the former. As we go into this interview, I want to thank our sponsor, Zenny Eyewear. It helps to make this possible. Uh, these guys, Zenny's a rock star brand. What can I tell you? I love that you can go to zenny.com, you can design your glasses however you want, any style, whether you want to look like Buddy Holly or, or Bono, Zenny has you covered. Check it out today again at zenny.com. I ran one of the biggest songs of the 80s and one of the most iconic songs of really any decade. That was not only so big in the US, but it's number one in Australia. Yeah. It hit the top 10 worldwide in so many different countries. I want to ask you specifically about that song and go through some different things because I'm talking about the wall of sound, that guitar feedback. Tell me kind of the invention of that song. Like I said earlier, we went to yeah. Zoo Records and there was photographs. One of the photographs was uh, a guy and a girl running away from a flying saucer. So that was, we were trying to say to Zoo, we can write songs about anything. We'll write a song about this picture. <laughs> um, that night or the night after something like that, we went to Eric's, which was a big club in Liverpool. There was a band on, and they did a song called I Ran. And it clicked that I ran, they ran, the picture, you know. Yeah. So we actually went back to our rehearsal room. This was like four in the morning and started rehearsing. And we had like some little ideas. Mm -hmm. So we started playing around with those and just singing I Ran and, and coming up with one or two lines. And from that, it just developed itself. For me, when a song is right, it writes itself. It starts to tell you what it wants next, you know, and, and I think my, the big drum roll and stuff just came from my brother being a bit frustrated, I think, about something. It's 
So he just started pounding his yeah, drums yeah, yeah. and we we're like, well, that sounds awesome. <laughs> and we just keep going, you know. Then it's like, what should we do after that? Uh, how about a lead break? And then, it, you know, it just started to arrange itself. I ran and then so far away. Was it something that you just kind of just it started just, singing out there? Or? Yeah, it just plucked it out of the air, you know. Wow. It could have been I ran through a field full of cabbages, but it, <laughs> it was so far away. Um, it's kind of weird when you're writing songs, you know, influences and other songs that you've heard come flying through your head, you know, mm -hmm. and even just one line can suddenly gravitate into your song. You know, we would, I would sing something and the other guys would go, yeah, do that again, sing that again. So, you know, we'd end up playing an hour long version of I Ran. Right. Singing that chorus 20 times until it just sounded and everyone would go, that's perfect. That's now. it. Now, now let's, you know, what are we going to do for the lead guitar, you know? And then you just start singing something. How about da 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 da? You know? And then Paul would just go, yeah, that sounds great. Da, da, da. And, and the song wrote itself. The video, so iconic, MTV. That was cool about the 80s and back in the day when you didn't have the internet and you couldn't find everything that you wanted about the artist. It was mysterious. Right. It's probably how it was for you with David Bowie and growing up yeah. with you guys, it was like that for me and my friends. And we we're like, who are these guys? And wh <laughs> are these, what, what is this? Who are these nutcases? <laughs> yeah. And so it was really cool, but that was the most viral video in MTV history, way before YouTube. Yeah, I've, I've heard that myself. And it's been more watched, obviously, by the world. Do you remember making the video? And take us to that day, if you don't mind. MTV contacted all the record companies saying, we're looking for new acts. This is a new idea for TV. And they said, can you get us some kind of promo from any new acts? So I, all I remember was we were called into the offices in the morning and they said, this afternoon, you're going to make a video. And we were like, what's a video? <laughs> <You know? laughs> and they gave us some money and went, here, go buy yourself some clothes that you like the fashion. And by the time you come back, the director and everyone will be here with the cameras and um, we'll make a video. So we're like, cool, okay, let's go. I think we got a hundred quid each or something. We went shopping in London, just down the road, got some clothes, uh, came back, makeup, cameras, bang. It was wow. all done in about two hours. I think they edited it that night. We saw it at nine o'clock in the morning and I think wow. it was on MTV the next morning. Wow. And MTV said, we're going to play it every hour on the hour or something like that. Cause they only had like six videos and, and suddenly we were like in that first batch. So we got like super rotation. They got a really good reaction from everybody and, uh, it just, just took off. I think we're one of the bands MTV made us. You know, yeah. because we had crazy style and they had this crazy idea of putting music out like that in that in their own new, completely new way. People would put us in a bracket that was this is where I am now. You know, I think a lot of kids were looking for something like that to 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 latch on to. No question. Because they couldn't relate to the big 70s bands and all that stuff, you know. I remember the generation that I grew up in was the Saturday morning cartoon generation mm -hmm. and uh, comic books were still, instead of comic book movies, it was a comic book. And, right. and it was cool to see something that was so colorful and so imaginative and sci-fi and futuristic. Right. And I saw a movie just recently where the guy says, what kind of band are you? It's set in the 80s. He's like, oh, we're futurists. And I was yeah. like, that's exactly it. That's what it was. Yeah. How do you do? This is the singer in the band I was telling you about. Oh, yeah, she played me a song, Good Vibes. A little bit of Duran Duran in there, a bit of new romance. What style would you say you were? I'm a futurist. Epic. See you in the future, then. Well, these days I call it future retro. So, you know. Yeah, it's exactly what it is. And even now, I mean, it's not only was big in the 80s, but that movement and what you started the song has lasted for decades and decades and will continue to. You know, Grand Theft Auto, yeah. video games, and Guitar Hero, Rock Band. I mean, you're on, Iran is on all of those. Yeah. And so I think all, all the kids that liked us then have grown up into big positions where they 
put their, the music they like in and <laughs> they grew That's, up with Iran, so they put it in. And the covers, there have been so many different covers. You, yeah. You've probably seen some of them. You ever seen Tori Amos's? No. I walk along the avenue. I never thought I'd need And Bowling for Soup, which was a big band yeah. in the late 90s. And I ran, I ran so far away. Of course, in movies, Hangover. I don't know if you saw Hangover 2. Part of the problem is that people tell me, and, you know, go see this, it's in it. And I go, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> you know, I'm <laughs> onto something else. And then, like, five years down the line, I go, I didn't know that was in that movie. Yeah. And, and then suddenly it's, you know. But it's like people skit us, but they don't forget us. <laughs> Wishing I had a photograph of you. That sounds totally different. <laughs> Tell me about putting that song together. I met a girl and I said to her, can I have a photograph of you? You know, because I just met her and I really liked her. And she went, no. I went to Mike Howlett's house and he just installed a studio. So I'm like, can I mess around? He said, yeah. So I already had that little riff, you know, the da 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 da. So I was just like, oh, I wish I had that photograph. And I just made it fit. I worked on that song for about four hours and then Mike came in and I said, what do you think of this song? He goes, it's brilliant. Give it to Clive, who was the head of Jive. Of course, we had, when it came to releasing another single, we'd run out of songs. And Clive said, what about that little song you showed me? Go into the studio for a week and turn it into a song. And it just turned out brilliant. If I had a photograph of you. It's interesting because it happened so much later from when you had that experience, you're able to tap back into that kind of yearning, that melancholy, because there's a real melancholy in that song. Yeah, well. I think what it was that I caught it in the demo. And even though it was, um, I don't know, maybe a year later, I still, when I listened to the demo to get everyone to rehearse it, I still went, oh, that sounds good. I'm going to sing it like that. It's not the things you say. It's not the things you do. The engineers and Mike Howlett and all that, they were not pressing me to sing in any false way. They're just like, you just sing it and we'll capture it. If I had And, you know, some, I'm so sure some producers go, hey, how about more like this or more like that? But I was allowed just to let it out and they caught it perfectly. Yeah, A Flock of Seagulls had four hits, including I Ran So Far Away. That one hit number nine with the most viral MTV video ever. Get away. And Space Age Love Song, one of my favorite songs of the 80s. Should have been a bigger hit. That one hit number 30. And then another parentheses song, Wishing I Had a Photograph of You, hit number 26. I wouldn't spend my life just wishing. And then uh, The More You Live, The More You Love. Uh, that one hit number 52, but it was a top 10 rock track, so I'm going to count that one. But by 1984, the band uh, pretty much faded. And after going through some new lineups, uh, Flock of Seagulls dissolved by 1986 after their fourth album. But Mike's score returned a few times with a new lineup in the mid-90s with the album The Light at the End of the World. That was unsuccessful during the grunge era, but the band would tour for the next few decades and recently reunited to record a new album. It's called In Flight, The Extended Essentials. Uh, extended versions of their biggest hits. And then came the orchestral album, String Theory. I'm gonna link to them below. That's what happened to them. Mike scores still tours all the time. Hey, leave us a comment about A Flock of Seagulls and Mike score. Uh, they sounded like the future in the early 80s. What do you think they sound like now? They still sound uh, amazing, so out there. Uh, write to us below, tell us in the comments. Make sure to subscribe below as well, hit the bell so that that way you never miss out. We're a daily channel. So there's always gonna be something good coming your way. Until next time, three chords and the truth, my friends. Talk to you soon.